Our guest speaker Wait. today. Oh my gosh. Check my nails. <laughs> Our guest speaker today is Louise Jett. Louise is a clergy leader in training with the American Ethical Union, and she is gracing us with her presence this summer as uh, she does her summer internship, our final step in becoming a leader. Her, her, in her real life, she is a professor at Lewis and Clark Technical College in Godfrey, Illinois. She, um, she has a, an amazing young adult son and a spouse and works in various capacities for various ethical societies around the country. And we are thrilled to have her here in person today presenting Reason, Discussion, and Compassion, Women and Ethical Humanism. So please join me in a rousing welcome for Louise Jett. Woo. You know so much about me. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here. Let me get situated. This is the second in-person platform I have ever given. And even though I teach, and I'm not nervous when I teach, I am nervous about public speaking. So I know, I can't get over it. I'm trying. Okay, let me pull up my notes. Of course, it's gonna give me a hard time. There we go. Okay. So good morning, thank you for joining me today. I am really honored to be here. And I wanna share with you some of the amazing women that we have in the ethical culture movement. So in March, the Missouri Women's Political Caucus held a multi-religious panel about the variety of religious beliefs around the issues of abortion and reproductive justice. An Ethical Society of St. Louis member, Allison Heil, was on the panel. And you can see her in the middle of this graphic that was created for the event. In my eyes, Heil is a humanist hero. She is the retired executive director of a statewide organization that trained adults to be better sexuality educators. She has worked in the fields of abortion care and sexual health education for more than 30 years. She's a founding board member of the Missouri Abortion Fund and their current board secretary. She is a champion for reproductive justice. During the panel discussion, which took place on Zoom, panelists of various religious faiths uh, shared their religious views on abortion. And I was so thankful that Allison was there. She represented ethical humanism perfectly. Some of the panelists expressed that their religious Religions favor a woman's right to have an abortion with few or no exceptions. Uh, the religions of other panelists call for some limits on when a woman could terminate her pregnancy. But Allison, who is a self-proclaimed abortion nerd, asserted that our movement supports the woman's right to choose regardless of the circumstances. And she expressed a life stance that centered the uh, excuse me, autonomy and humanity of women. She made it clear that supporting action to safe, uh, supporting um, access to safe legal abortion care is nothing to be ashamed of. And to me, this made her stand out among the panelists. During a platform Heil gave on abortion access post row earlier in this programming year, she stressed the need for us all to talk about reproductive rights. It was last August. She said, we can speak so that others can hear us. It is time that we stop being worried about whether we will be thought poorly of and take back the high moral ground. We have to outshine the opposition. Very few people believe in government mandated childbirth. And yet that is the power that has been given to the states. During the panelist discussion, Heil led by example, and she shined so brightly. I teared up. She made me so proud to be an ethical humanist. 
She carries on a tradition of humanist women who advocated for women and all people to gain access to health care, rights, freedoms, and other vital areas of life that are or were off limits to them. And I'm willing to bet that multiple women who are humanist heroes like Heil can be found in each of our congregations. Like, we don't have to look very far. Yeah. Jill loves this photo, by yeah. the way. <laughs> I know she, she encouraged me to poke fun at it. Um, <laughs> so we know, we all know and love Ethical Society Mid Rivers member Jill All, and she began her volunteer service following a 30 year teaching career when one of her own children came out as a member of the LGBTQ community. She is the founder of St. Charles P. Flag Chapter. Since its founding, Jill estimates that the St. Charles P. Flag Chapter has supported more than 400 families. She was also a regional director of P. Flag National for one term, which is a volunteer position. She is the current president of the Ethical Society Mid Rivers and has served on the American Ethical Union Board of Directors. She also served as the board vice president of the LGBT Center of St. Louis and co-founded Pride St. Charles. Jill also founded National Transgender Children Day, a day to honor transgender, transgender children and families, which is celebrated on October 26th. People who are parenting transgender children can post their photos on social media. The day can be promoted in communities and it helps shine a light on this brave and amazing population, which we really need right now. She was named a woman of achievement for her social justice work in 2019. And I was just so impressed the more and more I learned about her. She obviously knows how to get stuff done. She's kind and warm. I admire her intellect and drive very much and her compassion makes the world a better place for all people. She inspires me. And women like this are in all of our um, communities. Another example is Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture member and human rights and community activist, Muriel Tillinghast, and she led a fantastically impactful and inspiring life. I loved learning about her. She co-founded Lucy's Children in Brooklyn with Rita Wilson and Ellen Rader, and it's a discussion group that creates a greater cross-cultural understanding. She is a Howard University graduate and a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The committee emerged in 1960 from a student-led sit-in at the segregated lunch counters in Greensboro, North Carolina and Nashville, Tennessee. It sought to coordinate and assist direct action challenges to civic, uh, to civic segregation and political exclusion of black people. Muriel was, an, was instrumental as an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and one of three female organizers who headed countywide projects in Mississippi in 1964. She became the second state coordinator for the Council of Federated Organizations, the Umbrella Civil Rights Organization, which called for the famous Mississippi Summer Project. The volunteer-driven project tried to register as many black voters as possible in Mississippi, and it set up dozens of freedom schools, freedom houses, and other centers to serve black communities throughout the state. The Mississippi Summer Project had a huge impact on the civil rights movement by helping to break down isolation and repression that propped up white supremacy and the Jim Crow system. Also, before the Summer Project, the national news media didn't really cover the persecution of black voters in the South or the danger faced by civil rights activists, and the Summer Project changed that. Muriel's lifelong activism started early. She was a youth organizer in junior high and president of the Nonviolent Action Group in college. She was a desegregation activist in Washington, D.C., and she worked behind the scenes in the March on Washington. She once said, the movement continues in every aspect of my life. 
I have carried my understanding of its principles into the classroom, to work, into prisons and jails, and in my daily walk through life. It is vital to me as the air I breathe. And she walks the walk. She has worked on issues of tenant rights, prison education, medical experimentation, and immigration. And in 1996, she was the New York Green Party candidate for vice president alongside Ralph Nader. She has advocated tirelessly for decades, achieved many accomplishments, and received a plethora of accolades for her life's work. Far too many to mention here, but she's an outstanding example of ethics in action and the kind of woman that our movement cultivates. I love learning about her and other women humanists like her who have championed our values and strive to make our world a more just place throughout history. Women like Cora Calhoun Horn, grandmother of dancer, actress, singer, and civil rights activist Lena Horn, who attended the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture, which is a very diverse society and remains so to this day. Uh, she attended with her grandmother as a child. Uh, Cora was an early member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was founded by ethical culture members and a founding member of the Brooklyn chapter of the National Association of Colored Women in the late 1890s. African American women were often forced to establish their own suffrage organizations and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the dominant white suffrage organization, actually excluded black women from their conventions. In suffrage parades, black women were forced to march separately. Also, the history of women's suffrage, written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in the 1800s, 1880s, largely overlooked the contributions of black suffragists. The significance of black women in the movement went largely unnoticed and is still often ignored today. I know I didn't learn about it in school. The NACW's motto was lifting as we climb and members, including Calhoun Horn, advocated for women's rights as well as to uplift and improve the status of all black people. Even though black men officially had won the right to vote in 1870, voting required impossible literacy tests, high poll taxes, and grandfather clauses also prevented many black men from voting. The NACW suffragists warned and are wanted the vote for women and to ensure that black men could vote too. During World War I, in collaboration with the Brooklyn y, uh, YWCA, Calhoun Horn led a Red Cross unit that created and repaired bandages. I thought that was cool. In recognition of her contributions, she was appointed to the Mayor's Victory Committee. She also had held many leadership positions with the Brooklyn League on Urban Conditions and the Big Brother and Big Sister Federation. Calhoun Horn actively worked for black and women's causes all her life. Her husband, Edwin Horn, wrote of her, service was her religion. She enjoyed life to the fullest and was not forgetful of life's responsibilities. This resonates with me. Ethical humanism is my religion. I consider myself a congregation, congregational religious humanist, and I try to cultivate joy as I focus on ethical action. It's not always easy. And as a leader in training, I appreciate all the hard work and dedication of the women humanists who blazed the trails that led to opportunities for women to become leaders within ethical culture, a movement that wasn't always keen on membership, let alone leadership for women. Digging up some dirt. No. <laughs> Founded in 1876, the New York Society for Ethical Culture was the first ethical society and women were excluded from membership. Instead, they were allowed to join a ladies auxiliary. The Chicago Ethical Society allowed women to be official members when it was founded in 1882, and they kind of led on this movement, on this front. The New York Society followed suit in 1886, and membership was required to be offered to women in all societies in 1893. The first woman leader ordained a uh, Unitarian minister and feminist, Anna Garland Spencer, was hired by the New York Society in 1903 to be an associate leader. 
An educator and a feminist, Garland Spencer became the first female minister in the state of Rhode Island in 1891. During her Rhode Island years, she served as president of the Rhode Island Equal Suffrage Association, helped establish society for organizing charity and providence, and worked for the regulation of child labor and factory safety. Spencer's interest um, in pacifism led her to prominent positions with the National Peace and Arbitration Congress in 1907, and in 1915, she helped found the Women's Peace Party. She also became the first chairman of the National Board of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in 1919, and in 1920, led the National Council of Women, which is the oldest non-sectarian organization of women in America. And she once said, to the highest leadership among women, it is given to hold steadily in one hand the sacred vessels that hold the ancient sanctities of life, and in the other, a flaming torch to light the way for oncoming generations. Her lifelong work inspired the American Ethical Union to establish the Anna Garland Spencer Volunteer Award. It recognizes lay members for their significant volunteer contributions to the success of their society and or to the AEU. Garland Spencer paved the way for the modern women who are certified ethical culture leaders. Women I admire very much, like Dr. Nori Rost. Prior to joining the New York Society for Ethical Culture as its newest leader, Rost served at the All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, as their settled minister for 13 years. Before that, she was a minister with Metropolitan Community Church, a queer Christian domination for almost 20 years. She is passionate about social justice and has been involved in social rights activism since she was 17. She's an outspoken advocate for justice and equity and has received many awards and recognition for her work. Nori holds a Master of Divinity from the Elif School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, and a Doctor of Ministry from the um, Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In addition, she holds a certificate from the Spiritual Direction Center in Colorado Springs. She and ethical culture leader, Dr. J. Exodus Hooper, have started an experiment. It's called Ethics Unplugged. And each Wednesday, they host an in-person, live-streamed, talk show-like event that features music and more. And June's theme is Wild and Holy Embodiment. And I love that theme. Rose said the topic raised a few eyebrows among members who questioned why on earth they would be talking about our bodies and pleasure. And uh, Nori wrote an answer to this question in a recent blog post. She said, for one thing, I think it's extremely important for us to remember that we are embodied, that our bodies are good, and that experiencing pleasure in our bodies, whether through sexual intimacy with partners or with ourselves, or by taking a luxurious bubble bath or getting a mani-pedi is an important part of living fully into our humanity, which I think Lizzo was kind of singing about that earlier. <laughs> and I love this sex positive attitude, and I appreciate Nori's bravery in defense of her values. And that um, Ethics Unplugged is live streamed on the New York Society Facebook page on Wednesday nights if you want to check it out. It's a lot of fun. Nori's uh, predecessor was Dr. Ann Clayson, and she was the leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture from 2008 to 2009. She's retired and is now leader emerita. She holds a doctorate of ministry degree in pastoral counseling from Hebrew Union College, as well as master's degree in German from uh, State University of New York. In the mid 2000s, Ann served as humanist chaplain at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York, at a time when there were, it was unheard of to have humanist chaplains, let alone one who was a woman. She's also the former ethical humanist religious life advisor at Columbia University and the former humanist chaplain at New York University. Ann once wrote, we make ethical decisions all the time. Some are routine, imprinted on us from childhood and embedded in our culture. 
We may give little thought to greeting a neighbor, holding a door open for someone, or dropping money into a cup of someone experiencing homelessness. Others require more thought. A process of ethical discernment requires identifying an issue, acknowledging our feelings about it, gathering facts, and considering alternatives. Who are you and what kind of person do you want to be? How do you define goodness and how do you act the good? As the founder of Ethical Culture, Felix Adler once said, an outspoken champion for humanism and inspires me to act the good. I love that. And so do other women leaders. Former Riverdale Yonkers Society ethical culture leader Joan Johnson Lewis illuminates the history of ethical humanism in a way that helps me think deeply and make important connections. I cherish my time with her. She is the keeper of history and is so free with her time and has been a wonderful mentor to me. Uh, Joan has been an ethical culture leader since 1991. She has served ethical societies in Chicago, Northern Virginia, and even here, in, or even in Brooklyn. A third generation humanist, she is also an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister. She earned a Bachelor's of Arts um, in business and received a Master of Divinity from um, a theological school. She's a prolific writer. And for almost 20 years, she's published many thoughtful articles on ThoughtCo.com's women's history site. And for more than 25 years, she's maintained a quotations website. It's called Wisdom Quotes. She manages a popular women's history Facebook page. A quick Google search of her name and you will see that she is cited all over the internet. Joan recently wrote, as human beings, we are hardwired to connect. We are social beings adapted to live in groups. Our development of language made even more possibilities for connection. I can quote the thoughts of a poet who died some years ago and connect with them as a fellow human being. I have had more conversations about the history of ethical humanism and Felix Adler with Joan than anyone else. Each time I speak with her, I discover a more meaningful understanding of what we discussed, and I always look forward to our conversation and interactions. The first woman of ethical culture, uh, the first ethical culture leader who was a woman that influenced me was Kate Lovelady. She retired from being leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis in 2020, and she is now leader emeritus. She continues to serve as the main mentor for my leader training, and I'm grateful for her leadership and all she's taught me. Uh, Kate said, having a diverse and talented pool of leaders is crucial to the future of ethical humanism, and it's exciting to be a part of that process, especially to mentor new leaders in training. She began her journey of making positive change as a poet and a writer, but wanted to make an even greater impact and she eventually transitioned into her role as an ethical leader. She realized she could probably do more good in the world as a leader than as a writer and a poet. She said many of the goals are the same, like being a public learner, trying to understand human life, and sharing sources of meaning, comfort, and inspiration with others, especially to help more people have more meaningful and pleasurable lives. And that is what I love about our congregations, is they do help us cultivate meaning in our lives. After earning her certificate in pastoral counseling, um, Kate served as a leader in training under the Ethical Society of Northern Westchester leader, uh, Robert Burson, who was also <laughs> an awesome leader within our movement. She accepted her first professional leader position in 2005 at the Ethical Society of St. Louis after four years of study and internships through the American Ethical Union Leader Training Program. Kate spent 10 years as the single clergy member person for the St. Louis congregation and for the next five years with associate leader James Croft. I took this picture of Kate at the art museum. <laughs> I personally watched her in action and she modeled the behavior of an effective ethical humanist leader. She presented Sunday platforms and other programming, provided pastoral care and counseling to members, and led the congregation by helping the community live up to the values. There are specific platforms that I recall of Kate's when I need them <laughs> in my times when I'm struggling or facing, challenging, or facing challenges. 
She helped members cultivate meaning and bring the best out in one another while appreciating the uniqueness and worth of every individual. She was an energetic public speaker and skillful officiant. She said, although they are also sad occasions, some of my favorite times at the society have been presiding at the memorials of members, hearing about their early lives and stories by family and friends, and getting to celebrate their legacy. I have met so many amazing, inspiring people here, and not just those who've done great deeds, but also those who've simply tried their best to be good people and do their part however they could. Love Lady told me that the most exciting thing about a humanist community is that it is truly shaped by its members. She said, a society can be anything its members decide it can be. Do anything its members want to do. And if you don't know that you need this community now, joining will ensure that you, it'll still be here when you do need it. She stressed the importance of leaders who can listen and be non-judgmental. In fact, she told me one of her most important, one of the most important parts of providing pastoral care is acting as a non-judgmental presence, a person someone can tell anything. She taught me that leaders should help congregation members navigate feelings, become more open to relationships, and not take things personally. I know I could work on that. <laughs> Love Lady played a huge role in me wanting to become a leader myself. Her platform talks were full of practical, practical advice and thought-provoking wisdom. They were inspiring. They were empowering. They helped me truly embrace ethical humanism as my religion. I kind of powered up, right? <laughs> I leveled up. She was the first person that opened my eyes to the difference between secular and religious humanism. She helped me begin to shape my religious humanism, a process that will continue throughout my life because I want to play a role in our future and the future of ethical culture. Throughout our history, the women of ethical culture have met people on common ground to build communities of support and love through inclusion and communication, further proving there is no one right way to live and that we're stronger together. Because of the examples set by great women leaders, I strive to be a compelling mentor to my students, coworkers, colleagues, friends, and strangers. My goal is to help others find their islands of competency, places from which they can draw on their strengths, talents, skills, and passions for the motivation it takes to transform our communities. In other words, to elicit the best in others. It is an honor to be a leader in training. The opportunity to be a leader and an innovator, spreading humanistic values throughout space and time, and connecting people with the resources and information and support that they need to not only live expressive lives, but also further the growth of humanism, because I do think it can transform our world, this opportunity is not lost on me. Like many of the women before me, I understand both the responsibility and happiness that this endeavor brings. When I first began my leader training, the National Leader Council welcomed me during a ceremony. It was memorable. We were on Zoom, it was during COVID, and each leader bestowed upon me a sort of gift. To me, it felt very much like the scene in Sleeping Beauty when each of the fairies blesses the baby Princess Aurora with a special ability or trait and that may sound silly to you, but I was like so into it. <laughs> a fellow leader in training, Greg Bonin, thoughtfully transcribed the, the welcoming words and emailed them to me after the ceremony. And I cherished the entire experience and all the wisdom shared with me on that day. And I want to share with you the wishes and thoughts from our women leaders who were present. Joy McConnell wished me deep compassion. Joan Johnson Lewis paraphrased Joffrey Chaucer and said, gladly would she learn and gladly teach. Martha Gallahue advised that sometimes silence precedes the most creative action taken and encouraged me to now and again take pause. Boy, did I need to hear that. <laughs> Kate Lovelady told me to take all my vacation days and don't work too hard. She certainly does know me. 
and Amanda Poppy wished for me the joy of colleagues and friends, especially the joy and wisdom of the history holders. I'm happy to report that all these hopes and wishes for me are manifesting, except maybe for that part about taking my time off. There's just too much stuff to do. Anyway, those words offered on that day are precious to me and I carry them with me and I recall them when I need them. In that spirit, I'll conclude my talk with a personal hope and wish that you may carry with you if you choose to do so. One of my hopes is that ethical humanists completely recognize the contributions and efforts of all the women involved in our movement as tremendously valuable because they are. May we know our history, doing so is an important part of the work it takes to create our future. And one of my wishes is that we foster and support the next generation of women clergy and lay leaders, especially when they challenge us to be and do better. May we listen to them while celebrating their accomplishments and treasuring their perspectives. Thank you. Does anybody, has anyone in your congregation ever won the Anna Arlen Spencer Award? Yeah. I, 